Rhododendrons are a nuisance. Ornamental escapees turned invasive shrubs, they can cause headaches for those trying to conserve the British countryside. But what problems do they cause and what can be done about them? First of all, what are rhododendrons? There are actually many different types of rhododendrons around the globe, but for the sake of this video, I will be referring to the most widespread variety in the UK, Rhododendron ponticum. Rhodos then are large evergreen shrubs, reaching 8 metres in height, recognisable by their twisty branch systems, purple flowers and dark green oval shaped leaves. If you have visited a country park in Britain before, you've probably come across one or two. Despite their abundance in our parks, rhododendrons aren't native to the UK. Those in the wild are seemingly Spanish in origin being brought to Britain as ornamental plants during the second half of the 18th century. In short, the shrub's popularity bloomed with the perhaps naive Victorian gardeners and gamekeepers, which, when combined with the mature bushes being able to release around 1 million small airborne seeds annually, led to the spread of the plant in the wild. As a consequence, rhodos cover an estimated 3.3% of British woodlands today. Being widespread, however, doesn't necessarily mean that rhododendrons are problematic. After all, their flowers arguably have an aesthetic value, so how bad are rhodos anyway? Well, let's have a look at those flowers. Some honeybee species, for example, seem to avoid the introduced rhododendrons. The nectar being lethal to them may have something to do with it. Rhodonectar contains grainotoxins, which can be harmful to a few of the bee species in the UK. It seems only the pollinators tolerant to grainotoxins can use the rhododendron flowers as a food source, which isn't great for everything else, especially as rhododendrons are notorious for outcompeting the native plant species. There are a few reasons why rhododendrons have the knack of dominating the environment that they're in. Mature bushes have a dense canopy, which, when combined with an acidic leaf litter and a shallow root system, growth for other plants underneath becomes challenging. To add to this, rhododendrons establish quickly after fires, meaning that they can spread when the opportunity arises, at times to costly consequences, as we shall see later. Left unchecked, large swathes of rhododendrons can conquer the countryside. This can create issues not just for the local fauna and flora, but humans too. About a third of Killarney National Park in Ireland is covered with rhododendrons, leading to rescue operations every few years. That may seem drastic, but the gnarly maze of rhodo branches are seemingly disorienting, even being described as jungle-like. Rescue operations, such as the one in 2017, tend to consist of a helicopter flying overhead to help the lost find their way towards a body of water, where they can be transported by boat or chopper to safety. So, if we can agree that rhododendrons probably shouldn't be running wild in the British Isles, then what can be done about them? Well, the good news is that they can be removed. The bad news is that rhodos are stubborn, frustratingly so, and this can make control costly. When it comes to rhododendron removal, the first thing to recognise is that resources are usually quite limited. Therefore, if any work is to make progress, especially over a large area, planning is key. In short, the priority is to reduce the sources of seeds and so usually the larger, more mature rhododendrons are the first on the chopping list before moving to the smaller bushes. There are a few techniques when it comes to removing a full-grown rhododendron. If each of the stems accessible, then they may be individually drilled and filled with herbicides, killing the bush in 9 months or so. Otherwise, a machine flail or even hand cutting may be preferred, with herbicides also applied on any freshly cut stumps. Smaller rhodos are usually sprayed with herbicides or may be pulled out of the ground if young enough. Of course, none of this work is free. Herbicides, whilst they tend to be effective, are expensive financially. Cutting, on the other hand, often requires coordinated teams of volunteers, and so is expensive in people power. Rhododendron removal is often a costly ongoing process. Old stumps may have regrowth, which can flower in only 2-3 to three years, compared to the usual 12-15 to 15 for new plants. Eradication may take decades, with the added complication of seeds from an unseen flower or a far could still germinate, causing more work. Even after the rhodo bashing phase, vigilance is required. 
So, are Rojo Eradication Projects ever successful? Well, let's have a look at a project protecting a unique cabbage on a remote island, and how Rojo bashing has been taken to the cliffs to protect a few species of insects from potential worldwide extinction. Honestly, when it comes to cabbage conservation, little compares to this. Rhododendrons were brought into Lundy, a small island situated in the Bristol Channel, during the early 19th century. Originally, the rhodos were planted as ornamental shrubs in the Milcombe Gardens, but they ended up spreading, later aided by, you guessed it, a fire. There isn't anything on the records about controlling the invasive plants until around the 1950s, which, for the next half century, measures were only really effective at slowing the spread. The areas that were successfully cleared, were promptly recolonised by seeds from mature bushes protected by the steep slopes next to the sea. To add an extra layer of complication, Lundy is home to an endemic species of cabbage, which means the entire native population is limited to the one island. Whilst endemic cabbages are surprisingly common on small UK islands, the Lundy cabbage takes it to the next level by having not just one, but two endemic species of insects that live on the plant. For the future of the cabbage and the insects, it became of high importance that the Lundy cabbage was protected from the encroaching rhododendrons. In 1998, a control strategy was published, mapping which rhodos posed the most threat to the cabbages, the suggestion being to remove the rhododendrons in order priority. On top of this, the island gained more conservation staff, which was influential in turning the tide of rhododendron growth. A combination of chainsaws, volunteers and planning meant the last large accessible rodo was cut in 2011. Removing just the accessible seed sources, however, wasn't ever going to be good enough. In the year 2000, professional climbers started scaling the steep slopes for the first time, cliffside clearance becoming a mostly annual affair. Most of that, however, happened a few years ago. So, where is the project at now? We are now in our final stages of the eradication programme, with teams of volunteer work parties searching for every last plant. Over Covid we were set back a year, as we could not treat without the legally required training, which we could not legally attend due to lockdowns. Tactics shifted to pulling, an arduous task, but with instantaneous results. Hundreds of plants were pulled. We have at least another 10 years of vigilance left, and over 1,000 plants. But the end is in sight with single figure flowering plants all cut before going to seed. With the large amount of work that still must be done, it may be premature to declare the rhododendron eradication a complete success. Yet. However, it is hard to ignore the decades of hard work and dedication from the teams of volunteers and wardens on the island, and to their credit, the rhodo bashing is showing results. Gorse, which originally dominated the East Coast, has begun to return, and the East Coast is beginning to be, once again, a mosaic of habitats home to the incredibly specific species assemblage, which makes islands like Lundy so important for conservation. If you are living in the British Isles and have got this far into the video, you may start feeling the need to aid in the war against rhododendrons. And as cool as cliffside rhodo bashing on the remote island seems, for most of us, this is probably as detached from our lives as Lundy is from the mainland. So, what can you personally do about rhododendrons? A key thread throughout this video has been the importance of volunteering. If you are able to, I would suggest looking into what kind of help is needed near you. Most nature reserves and country parks will run some kind of volunteer group, and due to the prevalence of rhododendrons, rhodo bashing may be on the list of activities. As great as watching YouTube is, it's boots on the ground conservation where the real difference is made. 